theology of God that's being taught in that particular text. Then we expand and we go to a biblical theology and we look at how this exegesis uh, develops as we look at it across the canon from Genesis to Malachi and then from Matthew to Revelation and we consider it from a, a canon perspective where we walk through the Bible like I gave the example last week, uh, justification by faith. If you're going to build a theology from the Bible on that, you have to use these methods. But when you got to biblical theology, you would start with Genesis and see what the Bible had to say of it. And then watch a, and learn the progressive revelation of that doctrine throughout the Bible. And then after you have that, and this is something I left off last week, which we're not doing. Um, it's historical theology. And it's looking at how the church has interpreted that theology throughout history, the problems that the church has had to deal with in reference to that theology, like justification by faith. So after you went through the Bible, doing all the exegesis, you would go and look at major places in history where there's literature that dealt with that theology, like uh, the Reformation. And then you would have a better understanding there, and then you would build your systematics which is an overview of that doctrine, recognizing now that we have c combined all this information, let us correlate it, let us seek to cohere it, relate it to other doctrines, and make summary statements about it from a biblical perspective, and then you develop your practice on the basis of that. Yes, sir. Pastor Michael has a question. Yeah, and I don't want to stump you, but or like or put you in a, a hard spot. But this pyramid th does it come from a particular class that you t have taken, or maybe oh, yeah. a, a particular book that you've read, or is that a, is that a common way to lay it out? And the reason why I ask is where you have historic theology coming before systematic theology, in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, it almost seems like. Um, I don't know, in my mind, and I don't know if you've thought about this before, but, you know, that systematics in us compiling the teaching of the Scripture would come before his, um, historical theology and seeing what the church has taught concerning um, the particular doctrine. So have you, have you thought about that? Where did the pyramid come from? Has, is it something that you referred to? It, it's where you'll run across it in seminary studies is mostly in systematic classes or classes on systematic theology. Sometimes people will reference it in hermeneutics theology or a class on hermeneutics too because it, it helps the student see the place of hermeneutics in interpreting the Bible. Um, and I believe his, history comes at that stage uh, because here the theologian himself is doing the interpretation, but there he's seeking to see what others have interpreted of that as well. So he's getting a corporate interpretation before he tries to systematize those doctrines himself. So it, it helps uh, be careful with your systematics uh, so I think that's why it's or, uh, arranged that way. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so last week, if you have the handout, the bullet point number one was reviewing the biblical theology, and I uh, attempted to just remind you of some of those main headers of all the lessons that we've been through, and you can see the list there. Those are straight from our lesson titles. So every one of those bullet points we have at least one lesson, maybe two or three part lessons on, and you could go back to remind yourself of those. Point two, we got started on last week and almost finished developing a summary definition of the bib multiple biblical meanings of God's glory. So when we were looking at the biblical theology of God's glory over the last seven lessons, and now we're on lesson eight, we saw that the, the glory of God has a multiple meanings. It, the glory of the Lord is shown around them. You know, so that's some kind of physical manifestation. Um, 
The glory of the Lord uh, is in the tabernacle on the mercy seat. The glory of the Lord is in the cloud. Um, and then God is called the king of glory. Um, Jesus turned water into wine and it was to manifest the glory of God, glory of Jesus Christ. So there's a lot of different nuances and meanings. Jesus said, I will come in the glory of my Father. You know, what does that mean? And we looked at that. We got a lot of variety of meanings and nuances. Some of them were more full and broad sweeping meanings. Some of them were more narrow. And now we need to lay them out, so to speak, and familiarize ourselves looking at the forest of all these meanings. And that bullet point two, the sub-bullet, multiple biblical meanings of God's glory. I have seven listed there. That's not all of them. There are other ways to describe other meanings. So just consider this as more of a representative list, not a comprehensive list. And if you look at that, so some of the meanings that we saw for, the God, for God's glory was a designation for God himself um, in 2 Peter 1.17. Uh, he's called, uh, if you look at that real quick. When such a voice came to him, that's Jesus, from the excellent glory. That's a designation for God because that glory on the Mount of Transfiguration is not some, in, some object or something. That's, it's God the Father speaking to the disciples of his Son. And here, the God the Father is called the excellent glory. Uh, second meaning that we got was uh, uh, out of this representative list is an internal characteristic. So God's glory would, would reference God, an internal characteristic of God, an attribute of God, or uh, uh, even a summary of God's attributes. We saw that it was a, a word used to refer to God's presence. We saw in John 2 with the water to wine that it's a display of some, something of God's nature like his attributes or his perfections or his person. They're a manifestation of power. Um, we saw that all things are for the glory of God. So the whole goal of everything is for his glory. So there's a sense where the ultimate goal of the display of God's attributes is one of the meanings we got. And then we talk about dying and going to heaven and being in glory. That's heaven and the consummated experience of being in God's presence as glory. And then we also see that when people worship God, they're described as glorifying God. So it's the response of the creature to the creator from the, the redeemed one to the redeemer of worship and obedience. I added this and I want to just briefly, I, I, I want to try to help you make sense of this because it, it's not easy and that's why it's building. You see, reviewing, developing a summary definition is something that's ongoing. And then third point, understanding. So with this summary definition, we want to take all these meanings and come up with a summary definition. And before doing that, it's helpful to look, step, take a step back and observe um, and categorize these meanings that we have, considering redemptive history, considering the, considering the doctrine of God. And what we can see is that there, um, if you look at this list, a summary definition, observing and categorizing various meanings, uh, some meanings are describing or, or uh, referring to something about God's nature his attributes, it's a glory that he possesses or is tied to his nature. And that would be more in line with the, the meanings up above one and two. A designation for God himself, that's referring to something that God is or possesses. Possesses is, is just a helpful way to help you understand. He doesn't actually have it as if it weren't his. It is of him. 
but he possesses it. Speaking of his nature, God's internal characteristics, attribute or summary attributes. So we can categorize those as glory that deals with God's nature, his being, his person, the persons as well. Um, and then the, another way of categorizing is we see the, this reference of God manifesting his glory. Uh, and where we see God giving some form of a presence through a cloud or through an audible voice or uh, speaking and proclaiming his name. He's outwardly manifesting his own glory in a palpable way, whether to the ear or the sight or the senses. And he's manifesting a presence that he has and displaying himself, displaying something that he wants to be revealed. So meanings three and four above, God's presence and the display of his attributes, we could see how those go together. It's God displaying uh, his glory. And then we see uh, another uh, way in which we can categorize glory is it's ascribed. So when in Revelation they say glory and honor and blessing to him, we're, they're ascribing back to, to God's glory, to, to God glory. And meaning seven, that would be the appropriate response. And then glory received. So if you look at Revelation 4, if you'll turn to Revelation 4. No, it's, um, I'm sorry, it's 5. I'd like to go to 5, verse 12. It might be also there where I had put it. It says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing, And if you, go, uh, if you go back to Revelation 4 and look at 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. So there's this sense, too, where not only is it a scribe, but he's receiving. It's just it's the same uh, effect of, of giving God glory and him uh, receiving glory, uh, but it's just looking at it from his perspective. He's receiving it. And that's also meaning seven. And then glory shared is like in the meaning six, where in heaven, after the believers are either in the intermediate state or they're in the, the time of consummation where everybody's resurrected and in heaven with God, who were the elect, when they are with God in heaven, they are sharing in his glory. Not in the sense of his... Uh, ontological glory, his nature, like he is alone God and cannot um, communicate what is purely divine to the creature. However, in being in union with Christ, being born again and glorified, there is a moral nature and perfection that we commune with God in through the Spirit. So there's this glory being shared and that would be meaning a seven or six up above heaven and consummated experience. And then glory purpose. So we see that the ultimate goal is, if you remember Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of his glory. So the goal of salvation, of God's providence, that God's uh, creation, everything that God does is to give, bring back glory to him. And having looked at them in that way, categorized them, and observing these various meanings, uh, it does follow in this categorizing it and considering these things a, uh, a redemptive history kind of plan or order where it begins with God himself, who is f glorious, and then from himself displaying and then 
when that display actually leads to the regeneration and salvation of sinners, they ascribe back glory to him. Even uh, sinners who are unconverted do that at times. And then there is a reception we see on God's part. Um, and we see a sharing in the consummation of all things. And even now there is a sharing in a sense where we commune with God. And then we can see that this whole point of all of this is to God's praise, his glory. So with those categories and taking all those meanings and seeing how sometimes they reference God, sometimes they reference something he's doing on, in creation, and then it, sometimes it references ascribing glory and, and that, that whole order, uh, we have a summary definition, and I've added a couple points in there. So let me read that. It's on the handout. The triune God, who is glorious, displays his inter-Trinitarian glory. And that's the part I added. Largely through his creation, image bearers, providence, and redemptive acts, God's people respond by glorifying him. God receives glory and through uniting his people to Christ, shares his glory with them. All to his inter-Trinitarian glory. And the square brackets italics was my ad addition because I'm, in going through the synoptic gospels in John, one thing that was very clear to me is that we need to maintain a Trinitarian doctrine of the glory of God. And I just want to emphasize that with that definition. So you could word it a different way. It doesn't even read necessarily like a definition. It reads more like a summary statement. Um, but it does seek to bring together all those elements, at least the, the, the representative elements, maybe not encompassing every nuance that we cover, but it's seeking to bring the major elements of those meanings from the Bible and summarize them. Okay, so let's go to point two this morning. Any questions with that so far? Okay. The th third point, understanding how God's glory relates to God himself. You know, like when we think about other things that the Bible reveals about God, like impassibility, how does that relate to God himself? Immutability, like what is that saying what God is not? And then what might it reveal what God, who God is, what he is? So we're um, laboring to not just stop at a summary definition, but when we hear the word glory, what comes to our mind about God? That's, that's important, right? I mean, when you hear that, what comes to your mind? I bet you there's a diversity of meanings among us. Um, even with this summary, you might have a, an idea or a grasp of it and still not have a, um, a clear way to describe what comes to your mind when you hear the glory of God. So we need to understand how God's glory relates to God himself so that we can know what that means when we say it and when we read it in the Bible, we have an idea of what's being communicated. And I wanted to, to try to uh, show, show this. And I, I haven't really thought through a great analogy, so I'm just going to use some uh, uh, marks. If you have God's glory... And then you have this summary definition. That summary definition included a lot of aspects. Remember when we read that? Um, it, it included God's Glory being possessed, displayed, ascribed, received, shared, and purposed. That the summary definition attempt to involve itself with all those things. 
However, before you get to that, um, it kind of widens. What this can be summarized as, even boiled down, is uh, God's intrinsic glory and God's extrinsic. It's kind of like this is a, a phrase and a concept that is uh, complex and diverse and deep. And to further a, uh, attempt to specify what this means, we would next go and describe it as two major aspects. When, when we're speaking of God's glory, there's two major categories that we're speaking of. God's intrinsic glory and God's extrinsic glory. And then from there, we get even more specific with it being possessed, displayed, ascribed, shared, um, and the goal or purpose. So really all this is in this point, and I'll, I want to show that to you, but uh, I, wanna, I want you to understand why, why, why we're using this why these words are coming up and why they fall into the outline the way they're falling into the outline. It's because, in a sense, this is a broader way, a simpler way of describing that. It's more fundamental. And this is the specifics of that. If we wanted to carry it out further, we would go and, and list out all those multiple meanings. It just, it's going from general to, to more and more specific. And um, it's helpful to have these categories because it will help you think. See, because I, I don't, that whole summary definition doesn't come to my mind when I read the Bible immediately. I have to think about it, you know, and then ask myself what part of this definition am I in. But to have these broad categories and to know that that's biblical helps. So let's look at that. God's intrinsic and extrinsic glory, fundamental to the summary definition. It's, it's kind of like uh, the ground of the summary and just so you, I put, these are just Webster dictionary definitions of the word intrinsic and extrinsic. It's in there on your handout. It's just so, in case that word is unfamiliar to you, you can have a sense of why those words are being used, what they mean. So intrinsic means, and granted this is a Webster's dictionary, it's not a theological dictionary, it's not attempting to speak specifically about God. But we're using this language, so let's understand what the language means. Intrinsic means belonging to the real nature of a thing. Essential or inherent. And then extrinsic is not really belonging to the real nature of a thing with which it is connected. It's not inherent. It refers to that which may be connected to something else, but is not an essential part of it. So um, you have to think with me. The intrinsic glory of God, what is that? If, if, you, if you tried to understand what I'm saying or an author saying when he says the intrinsic glory of God, knowing what intrinsic means from this word definition, what do you think that that's describing? Just to get some dialogue here. Sarah. Sarah. Um, his intrinsic glory would be um, who he is as God. So his attributes, um, like in Exodus 33 and 44. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amen. And that's why I have those texts there. If you go um, look at Exodus 34. Actually, we'll start in 33 because there's a whole dialogue here, a whole context. Exodus 33, 18 Moses says in verse 18, please show me your glory. And then the Lord says, I will make all my goodness pass before you and I will proclaim the name of the Lord. 
I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. So he's showing his glory or he's declaring his glory. And then later in 34, we're going to see a manifestation of that. And what is this glory referencing? Of course, there's this presence there with a, a, uh, a declaration or a proclamation of God's nature. But those proclamations are speaking to God about God. So intrinsically, God is glory. When Moses says, show me your glory, he's not talking about some light or some cloud or manifestation. He's wanting to know the nature of the true and living God, Yahweh. When he says, show me your glory, which you possess, who you are, he's speaking of God's intrinsic glory, that glory that is, is, that is of his essence. And then the Lord says, I will be gracious to whom I'll be gracious. That's a revelation of something about God, is that he is sovereign. Um, so God's glory includes his sovereignty there. And you see how that's intrinsic? It's not, tell, he's not saying, show me your, some beautiful display, like with my eyes. He's wanting, and, and he, but he's not, it's not, I'm not saying that Moses would not be willing to receive that, the, but what is Moses' point? I want to know who you are. Show me your glory. And those believers in Israel knew that the Shekinah glory was not God. Like it was just a, a manifestation of God that he chose to manifest in that time. Uh, even Solomon said, the heavens cannot contain you. you know? So when they, when they want to know the glory of God, that's what they want to know, the intrinsic glory of God. That which is belonging to the real nature of who he is. But extrinsically, um, it's, it's, it says here, not really belonging, that's just the word definition. It's those things that God does in history and in creation. Really everything that we have. I mean, even the heavens declare the glory of God. So everything that comes into contact with our eyes, the whole earth is full of his glory, uh, is a display. Uh, it's extrinsic. God is not uh, of his creation. He's not of um, the earth. He created the earth and he sustains it according to his laws. And he can go against them however he wants. Um, but what, when we speak of that glory, what we're talking about is that which is not essential to his nature. He's chosen and he manifests it through his decree and then the carrying out of that decree in providence, creation of providence. But it's not essential to him. It's just out of his own will and good pleasure to manifest something of himself in those glorious things. So uh, when we speak of God's extrinsic glory, I'm just describing these two terms. We're speaking of those things that are not essential to God, but yet in and of themselves they're glorious and they teach us about the intrinsic glory of God in something, in some way. Does that make sense as far as describing those two terms? Any questions on those two terms? Sergio? I was going to ask if you could repeat the definition for the intrinsic. Okay, it's on your handout, and it's intrinsic. Um, it doesn't have page numbers, but it's under the third bullet, third major bullet. Intrinsic, belonging to the real, real nature of a thing. Essential or inherent. Okay, another question? Would his extrinsic glory include our response? Oh, yes. I, uh, yes. Uh, I think of uh, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is him who works in you, both to do and to will for his good pleasure. You know, so like even our response is 
why do we give why do we ascribe glory to him for our response it's because it came the 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 cause of that response was him so the fact that we respond and we've been saved by the blood of the lamb and applied by the spirit is a manifestation of God's extrinsic glory And if you think, too, is, is his saving a sinner essential to his nature? In one sense, we see that God is love, and it, co- it, it's, it makes perfect sense when we understand the, the God's nature and his justice and mercy in the cross, and they see it. But it, the, the covenants that God makes is not ne- essential to his nature. There was nothing that God needs. If you go back to God's aseity, um, he doesn't need creation to exist to, for his blessedness, for his fullness, um, in any sense of the term, relationally or sustenance or any way. So if you think of that... Uh, all of God's work in redemptive history is in no way need, needed by God. It's extrinsic manifestation of who he is. So, again, why go back there? Because if, if you go back to the page one, you see that that under major bullet, uh, major part number two, developing a summary definition. Under that sub-bullet, summary definition, there's that list there. Who can tell me out of that list which ones of those listed there would be subsumed under God's intrinsic glory? Which ones are related to God's intrinsic glory? Noel? A, des- <clears throat> a designation of God himself, one, and then the second one, in, an internal characteristic attribute or summary of, of attributes of God. Yeah, amen. Uh, and below there, it would be that, that bullet, God possess- glory possessed. And there are others, you know, we know that all of God's extrinsic glory, those things he does that are not essential to his nature, but he does out of his goodwill, good pleasure, and uh, are grounded in his essential nature, yet he does freely uh, without compulsion or need. When he, when he does those things, of course we know those things are telling us something about God's essential nature, but... He in no way is um, intrinsically uh, necessitated to display his glory in creation the way he does. So all those bullets after that, glory displayed, glory ascribed, glory received, glory shared, and glory purposed are extrinsic. And the reason why I asked us to do that and think about that is I'm wanting you to see that there's a relate. We're not just, these aren't isolated points. These, there's a relationship here. We're really talking about the summary definition, but just in two major categories. We're talking about the multiple meanings, but just in two major categories. We're talking about God's glory, but in two major categories. I'm wanting to focus there, but I'm wanting to see how they're connected to these other things. And uh, theologians have picked up on this. We're not like coming up with this stuff on our own. Um, though we, are, we have warrant to if, if it's biblical. But uh, there are great believers that God has gifted that came before us and I'll share with you something. Gersh- Gershner, 
explains about Jonathan Edwards. And he looked at Jonathan Edwards' sermon on Psalm 89.6. So if you look at Psalm 89.6... For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? So Jonathan Edwards gave a sermon on it, and then later, years later, Gershner writes about Edwards' theology of God's glory. And we're, this is a little bit of that historical part, just to let you know that this is something that um, has been covered and we can compare against and gain some uh, encouragement from others. In the sermon on Psalm 89.6, Edwards had the glory of God consisting in God's greatness and goodness. So glory for him, and this is what I, I believe is biblical, is another word used for the sum total of all divine excellencies. And we haven't got there yet, but we'll get there. And the glory is, of God refers to the internal as well as the manifestative glory. So the glory of God refers to the internal glory of God and the manifestative glory of God. That's intrinsic and extrinsic. The latter, the manifestative glory of God, amounts to a setting forth of the attributes in their reality and fullness. And all I'm going there is just to help you see that this is something in systematic theology that theologians are attempting to grasp. And there is this two major categories of considering it. And my conscience is clear with that because I see how there are texts that reference God's nature and his name and there are texts that reference God's outworking. So when somebody says, those are two different categories, I see a distinction there, and I also see that they're related. So I don't have a... If, if they put internal and external, that probably wouldn't bother me. The, 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 the point isn't like this magical word. It's just understanding these concepts that the glory of God exist in two major categories. And then we can, we can come to a summary definition and get more and more detail with it, more and more specific. And we can go and look at all the multiple meanings and get more and more specific. But I don't have a problem saying, oh, when I look back at all these multiple meanings, I do see that I can lump uh, all these in, in reference to God's essential nature, and I can lump all these into what God does. Uh, Robinson. Um, just wanted to make a connection. Looking at the board on the right side uh, with God's glory, intrinsic and extrinsic, if we wanted to flesh out intrinsic, uh, some of the examples would be what we're studying on Tuesday nights, like the fact that God doesn't change. Yes. He's eternal, has no emotions. Well, yes, right. thank you so much. That's a very good question. And that's really what we want to discover because there are some theologians like an Old Testament biblical theology uh, author might see in that limited amount of revelation that God's glory predominantly references his presence. So they want to define in uh, almost a umbrella term in this limited sense of God's presence. But if we look at all of the revelation, we can see that, that it doesn't just get uh, used to describe God's presence. It gets used to describe, describe God's name and his attributes, his works. Um, and we need to uh, labor to understand it from the whole scope of Scripture. And that intrinsic part, when we talk about God's essential nature, and we say, if I say God's glory... And I'm thinking not of these two categories simultaneously, but I'm just thinking of that. And I'm wanting to communicate that to somebody. How do I know 
what I'm speaking of when I think of God's intrinsic glory. Is it one attribute? Is it multiple attributes? Is it his, a, a specific perspective reference to his fullness? Uh, or, uh, and we know that God is not divided up into parts. He's simple. So if he's, um, justice, he's justice, he's eternally justice. You know, if he's love, he's eternally love. We know that, that, that the attributes aren't divided up. But when we say an attribute, we know what we're attempting to think about from Revelation and focus our, our sight upon in this incomprehensible God. And when we say God's glory, and we're trying to think of particularly his intrinsic, the question comes up, what are we considering? What, is, what do we believe that refers to in God? If I said immutability, you would know what I'm seeking, some better than others, what I'm seeking to refer to in the nature of God. But when I say God's intrinsic glory, what am I referring to? That's what this bullet's all about. It's saying understanding how God's glory relates to God himself. And I'm, I'm still under the first bullet point and then under extrinsic. The glory of God is the extrinsic manifestation of the intrinsic. So the glory of God is the extrinsic manifestation of the intrinsic. And if you look at Romans 11.36... Uh, and I want to make a comment too, like um, I was thinking about how this is, this is very, very challenging. And to go through it and, and to repeat and to give, uh, saying the same thing different ways to help you uh, try to understand what's being taught, uh, you can have the thought that how is this profitable or how is this going to be applied or how am I going to benefit? Um, and there are uses that we can try to emphasize and um, that's going to come up in the pr practical theology. However, even if I don't hit on, hit on it today, this un your, your way of thinking and believing your way of, com the, the God you consider when you pray and when you read, um, if, it's, if you're not continuing to be sanctified and reformed in your thought and you don't take these kinds of these studies serious, uh, you're, you're, going to, um, you're going to not be profited when you... To, to, to where you should be profited when you pray, you know, um, or when you read the Bible, or when you preach to others, uh, or when COVID happens, or when you have a physical ailment, or when a loved one had, comes under some danger, or, is, or there's death. All these things in life, all these trials, persecution, and adversity, um, if, if you don't Consider this important and see that this will actually impact the way you respond to providence and inform your faith appropriately. Of course, we know that we need the Spirit to apply these things, but um, it's, it's very uh, beneficial, even though it might seem like it's tedious. And I don't think that everybody thinks it's tedious. But to some, they might. And I'm letting you know, please bear with us. Bear with the scripture. Humble yourself. Because having these, thought, these thoughts well organized around the biblical revelation helps you understand God better and commune with him uh, faith, more faithfully. So, understanding how God's glory relates to himself. And now... Uh, oh, we were going to turn to Proverbs 11.36. For of him, through him, and to him are all things. To whom be the glory forever. Amen. 
of him, through him, and to him are all things. Okay, which part of those phrases of, through, and to is intrinsic? Speaking of God's intrinsic glory. I'm sorry, I said Proverbs. Romans 11.36 Uh, Romans eleven thirty six, and that that's actually a, a, pr- a very pregnant statement because Paul's just spent eleven chapters speaking about the gospel in its doctrinal, systematic way, and then he sums it up. So this is encompassing a lot here, but for of him, through him, and to him. So of him, through him, and to him. Three things there. Three prepositional phrases. Which one speaks of God's intrinsic glory? From him. Yep. Yeah, yours has from, but that, that first one, of, uh, from. from yeah. He's the source, so we're speaking of his essential nature. And then through him and to him are his extrinsic. But you can see there, there's this going out from his nature in salvation and in the gospel. And then things are sustained and brought about through him. And then they all return back to him. Um, so you can see that that is a biblical ordering where it, it begins with the person and the nature of God and goes from him and back to him, from him and back to him. And this intrinsic is the from, and this is through and to. That's just a, a way of helping you continue to repeat the same thing so that it reinforces what your understanding of those two things are. Now let's go to this next part. A wide-ranging view of God's intrinsic glory. I was circling this, right? What is our understanding of God's intrinsic glory? When we use this word glory, not immutability, not justice, not love, not mercy, but glory. And we're speaking about God's in, in God, in, about it with reference to God intrinsically. What are we thinking about? And this bullet already is telling you some there. It's saying a wide-ranging view of God's glory, intrinsic glory. So here's the question. Is God's intrinsic glory an attribute, a summary of attributes or a summary attribute? Is it God's being or the outward expression of his being? And there's some people that say that God's presence being manifested outwardly in Israel is his intrinsic glory. They, they, they confused it. And they combine it. So that's why that question is there, because there's some diversity among theologians. Answer, knowing that God's extrinsic glory displays his intrinsic glory, we must look at God's extrinsic glory in Scripture to answer the question. So what we're going to do, why, why do we have to look at this to understand that? like scripture, the works of God, history, creation, providence. Why do we have to look here in order to help us understand what that is? God's intrinsic glory in and of himself is too lofty. We cannot attain it. You know, it's uh, not something that we can relate to, comprehend. I think that that study on simplicity was very, very helpful. Um, and I'm sure there's a, a, a difference in different theologians and how they consider the being of God or whether he's simple or not or what that really means to be simple without parts. Um, because in God, in his, in his essential being, there really isn't a, an attribute or a list of attributes in the being of God. There is only God in his godness. But the way that he manifests his godness through creation, redemptive history, 
uh, we see like a, a multitude of, we see God, God's godness in a multitude of like creaturely perfections. You know? Yeah, amen. Amen. So the, this is the only way that we can know God is if he doesn't act first and, and because he's incomprehensible. So even though we're going to look at Scripture that is actually a, a manifestation of God's glory, we're going to ask questions of the, the Scriptures, what is that revealing about God's intrinsic glory? Like when somebody saw Jesus turn water to wine, that event, do you believe everybody became a believer in God through that event? No, he performed many miracles and people hardened their hearts against him. Uh, but can people still testify that that was glorious? What are they speaking of the glory of? They're speaking of the glory of the extrinsic. And if we went to the water and the wine, what we're not talking about is the glory of that, that event. We're, we're wanting to seek to understand from that event uh, the, the nature of the God who caused that event. And some people don't make that, that connection. They just stop there and they marvel. Um, so the next bullet here. What does Scripture and the displays of God's extrinsic glory teach us of God's intrinsic glory? And if you remember, uh, we looked at Exodus 33 earlier where Moses says, show me your glory. And then he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. Go to Exodus 40. And I know that this is a, a, re a repetition for everybody. Maybe not this particular verse, but looking at how glory takes on the meaning of presence. Uh, we've seen that before, but just just a reminder. Then the cloud, uh, Exodus 40, verse 34. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And there we're speaking of God's glory and we know that's an ex extrinsic manifestation of God's glory. But he is it's revealing something about God that he is protecting. He's guiding because it says later whenever the cloud was taken up that the children of Israel would leave. And when the cloud remained, they remained. So God was leading by that presence. So we see God's uh, grace. We see God's sovereign power over the nature we see God's leadership and his sovereign guiding of his chosen people. And the word, the glory of God, is a reference to his presence. And turn to Psalm 24. This is one of the memory verses because this is a good summary or it's a good reminder. 24, 7 through 10. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Selah. That's a title or a designation. He's the King of glory. It's speaking about that designation is referring to his intrinsic glory. And specifically, we can see here, who is this king of glory? He's strong. So it's a reference to his omnipotence. 
Why does he have that title or that designation, the king of glory? Because of his strength. Because of his omnipotence. And his justice, he's mighty in battle. His grace to deliver those who he's covenanted with. And then later, the Lord of hosts. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. The armies. So, <clears throat> you can see there, and I'm going to uh, skip now and just uh, read something out of this book to close. Also, if we look more closely, we would see in Psalm 19, or not more closely, but we continued that God's glory is a reference to his works, like in creation, providence, and salvation. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, so we can see, yes, there's the extrinsic glory of God in his creation. Um, however, that creation is referring to and teaching us something about God's intrinsic glory. His wisdom, his power, his grace to initiate that and to cause it. And we could go on. Many other attributes that get referenced when we say the heavens declare what? The glory of God. Well, now let's start to measure the heavens and consider what that's teaching us about God with a biblical lens. And we're going to come up with a whole bunch of information. So also Isaiah 6, when uh, Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up and the, cher uh, the seraphim were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then John later picks up in chapter 12, verse 41, when Isaiah saw his glory. And who did Isaiah see? The glory of Jesus Christ. So there we see that high and lifted up vision and all those uh, nuances of that vision are teaching us about the glory of God. He's holy, separated, Different, unique, and worthy of all praise, obedience, and adoration. And then we could go to Romans 6 and actually look at that last one and then I'll, make, I'll read and then we'll stop. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Not by the power of the Father, by the glory. So you can see there, the glory is a reference to God's fulfillment of the covenant of redemption promise to resurrect his son, having completed his humiliation. And it's, we know it's a reference to his omnipotence and other things. So, having said that, oh, I'd like to read this. Scripture adjoins a display of the glory of God to a variety of His attributes. His holiness, His power, His beauty, His majesty, His goodness, His salvation, creation, providence, His judgment. Scripture adjoins God's glory to victory. And even more astounding is that Scripture links our triune God's glory with more holistic ideas that stress His very nature, like His presence, His name, His holiness. Old Testament scholars see His glory as His essence. It's spoken of as His face, the spirit of fullness. It's a reference to fullness and honor. Since God's glory is the extrinsic display of so many attributes and of a panorama of God's works and of holistic terms related to God's very nature, it is clear that God's intrinsic glory must be viewed holistically. It's not up under a, a holistic term. It is a holistic term. Put differently, if the display of God's power is the display of his glory, if a display of God's holiness is, is a display of his glory, and if his presence is the central meaning of his glory, then glory must be something broad enough to cover such wide-ranging depictions. 
God's intrinsic glory is broader than a single attribute. It corresponds with his very being and sometimes functions as a sort of summation of his attributes. And listen to Edwards. The thing signified by that name, the glory of God, when spoken of as the supreme and ultimate end of all God's works, is the emanation and true external expression of God's internal glory and fullness. In other words, God's internal glory in a true and just exhibition. So it's a, uh, a holistic term that encompasses um, all of those attributes. It gets reference to his name and his presence, his works. And when we think of God's glory in these two categories, and when we're thinking about God's nature and we say God's glory, we don't need to be limited to a particular perspective, but remember that it's a holistic term. Let's, let's uh, close for time's sake. Father in heaven, King of glory, um, thank you for the revelation of this word and of your very nature. Help us, Lord, to be humbled by your glory and to ascribe glory with you, or not with you, but to you, and share with you in the glory of this salvation and union with your Son. Thank you again for the time, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.